So thank you very much again for being here. I want to thank Town Hall Seattle, which is an amazing civic resource um, uh, in our midst, as well as the League of Women Voters for making this um, afternoon's event possible. In addition, I want to give a shout out to some organizations wh who have supported the work that I'm going to be presenting on today. And those include some local ones of Four Culture, Jack Straw, and Hedgebrook, and then at the state level, um, Humanities Washington, and at the federal level, or national level, um, the National, Human uh, national um, Endowment for the Humanities. And so I just want to, to thank them. And the other thing I want to just mention before I move on, and by the way, I'm a professor, but I'm not going to kill you with PowerPoint <laughs> this afternoon, I promise you. It's mostly photographs and some resources and some uplifting kinds of things towards the end. Um, but what I want to um, start off with, I was asked to um, speak from my first book, Catching Homelessness, A Nurse's Story of Falling Through the Safety Net. Um, and that came out in 2016. It's what I call a personal policy narrative. So it includes, it weaves in some aspects of memoir, um, but with larger health and social policy issues. That came out in two, 2016. Um, in 2018, I had a follow-up book that really deepened um, kind of my understanding um, exploration of especially trauma-informed care as it um, relates to healthcare and homelessness. And both of those, by the way, um, uh, that one came out from University of California, Medical Humanities Press, and they're both um, available here today. And the, the proceeds go to benefit the amazing organization of Operation Nightwatch. But I also want to um, pull in, and I'll do some readings right towards the end, of today's talk um, that's from my most recent work that should be coming out at the end of this year from Johns Hopkins University Press. And that one is a provisional title of Skid Road, the Intersection of Health and Homelessness in an American Frontier City. And it is a narrative history of here, of uh, Seattle, King County. It includes, um, have an ongoing collection, but right now I have close to 40 oral history interviews that I have done, they will be um, uh, an archived at University of Washington when I'm finished. And, um, and they include some oral history interviews with people, and the, there's some in the audience who I haven't gotten to yet, like Johnny Ota, I'm gonna interview you for it, that I'll, I'll weave in um, to, the, to today's talk. And one of the people I had the privilege of speaking with a couple of years ago for the Skid Road Project was the Reverend Rick Reynolds. And one thing that he mentioned that I think is extremely pertinent now, um, it's, not, it's actually gotten worse in the past couple of years since I interviewed him, and that also goes into my talk, is the fact that the cost of living in our, in our city, in our region, is affecting so many people. Um, but to remember that the frontline staff who are doing the work of providing um, you know, different kinds of resources for people in poverty and homelessness, that work is extremely um, emotionally, takes an, um, an emotional toll, but also they do not get a living wage. Um, and that many of them then are um, at risk of becoming homeless themselves. So I think that that's something that's, that's really important to remember. So stories matter. And what I want to do first is to read something that I wrote um, that's titled Stories Matter. Stories matter. Many stories matter. State's author, Shimamanda Ngozi Adichie, in her powerful TED Talk, The Danger of a Single Story. Adichie points out that listening and clinging to a single story about a person, a place, a situation, creates stereotypes. And in her words, the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. She goes on to say, the consequence 
of the single story is this. It robs people of dignity. It makes our recognition of our common humanity difficult. It emphasizes how we're different rather than how we're similar. And in reflecting on her words, her wise words, about my own work, I say, advocacy is not about speaking for those less fortunate, less powerful, but of using our own power and privilege to amplify their voices, their stories. Our job as healthcare providers, as compassionate citizens, is to step back and listen respectfully. Stories matter to the teller and to the listener. What we need more of in this world is for all of us to increase our capacity to listen to a multiplicity of stories, and within those stories, to recognize our common humanity. So um, with this one, it's a photo montage of uh, some public art. The one on the, the right-hand side with the dollar signs is by um, uh, Hichivi Edgar Heap of Birds. It's called Day Night, and it's a public um, piece of art that's in Pioneer Place Park, along with a photo montage of some street art that's in an alleyway in Pioneer Square. And I have this up here, again, as the introduction um, was reminding us that we are on Duwamish land, and that whenever we talk about homelessness, especially in Seattle, King County, we have to acknowledge the um, intergenerational and historical trauma um, that, that all of us have, have perpetuated in terms of, of uh, homelessness, uh, disconnection for our um, indigenous um, brothers and sisters. And if you don't know this, um, in Seattle King County, people who are Native American, Native Alaskan, are approximately 10 times as likely to become homeless and to be caught up in chronic homelessness. If you, speaking of books, um, if you have not read um, historian Call Thresh's book, Native Seattle, The His Histories of the Crossing Over Place, I highly recommend it. And um, he writes about, he's coined a term which really resonates for me that I'll bring up in my, in my talk. And that is the concept of place stories. And in my kind of um, understanding of it, uh, paraphrase, place as in geographical location layered with a multiplicity of stories, of hauntings of individual and collective, oftentimes deeply traumatic and suppressed stories. And with this, I want to read an excerpt from Seattle's poem. We have a poem, and it's by our um, Seattle's first civic poet, um, Claudia Castro Luna. It's a beautiful poem, and it's in her chapbook, uh, This City. I'll just read some excerpts from it. Every day, we tread over Chief Sell's legacy, his prophetic words, at night, when the streets will be silent, and you think them deserted. They will throng with the returning hosts that once filled them, and still love this beautiful land. We are not alone. Save for his people, we are all immigrants here. Waiter, teacher, artist, worker, nurse. We belong. All of us belong. Seattle is a house we all need to afford. Speaking of place stories, um, this is a photograph that I took when I was teaching a health humanities course to Harborview nurses in the summer of 2015. And um, if, when I look at this, and obviously it's showing in the foreground the demolition of Yesler um, Terrace public housing, and in the background the towers of the Art Deco towers of um, our Region 1, um, Level 1 uh, Regional Trauma Center of Harborview Medical Center. Um, and just, again, to go back to place stories of how many stories. When I look at this photograph, I just kind of hear murmurings of so many stories of people who lived in Yesler Terrace. 
um, including one of our, our former uh, governors. And also, obviously, the, the voices and the stories of people who have benefited from the health care, compassionate health care of Harborview Medical Center and who have died there. Um, I want to, again, and I could, I could talk about this for too long, so I won't. I'll, um, I'll shorten it, but that, you know, we have a lot that we can be very proud of in, um, in King County in Seattle. And if you don't know, um, Yesler Terrace Housing was our nation's first racially integrated public housing, uh, opened in 1941. However, when you dig down into that, um, we recognize that we have in King County, still on the books, unfortunately, um, racial restrictive covenants. And Pill Hill, um, it was called Profanity Hill, First Hill was one of the only um, areas of Seattle um, back during the Depression that did not have one of those covenants. So it was like the only place that people of color could actually live. And then the other caveat here is obviously it's been re, uh, it's been it's been demolished and redesigned as mixed income housing, but to again acknowledge the displacement of hundreds of people who have not been able to go back and have affordable housing. So history, I love this photo. This is a photo montage um, that the Seattle PI took, and it's in it's in there. Um, in their newspaper article that is listed up there from the Great Depression. It's a fascinating story to read along with it. It shows an actual Beacon Hill housewife um, pointing out of her living room window on Beacon Hill um, down at Soto and that the shanty town, the shack town that she's referring to, those people that she's pointing at are residents of Hooverville, which was again like our nation's largest and longest lasting um, homeless encampment during the Great Depression. We have different kinds of things. That's not something to be proud of, right? <laughs> it's something to, to recognize. And this I like to show because it's so current, right? Um, if you hear, like all of us, in terms of the discourse, it is human nature, those people, but just as a cautionary tale for all of us when we're, when we're absorbing media, when we're passing on, when we're having conversations with our families and loved ones, to really kind of check ourselves when we're doing that finger pointing in those people. Because again, that's, that's pushing people away. So, my story. Um, this is a photograph that I took in the spring of 2016 when I was uh, with a group of our nursing students from the University of Washington and we were doing foot care for the residents of Tent City 3. And at this point it was in the parking lot of the United Church of Christ. And I, I do want to do a shout out here um, that even though Seattle has long been and still is one of our most secular cities, um, our churches, our faith-based communities, um, our faith-based people, have an outsized, outsized role in terms of our development on um, prohibition, women's vote, um, and homelessness services. So just a shout out to them. And this, uh, up in the background, you can see uh, University of Washington Tower, it used to be the Safeco building, and in the middle ground, you can't see it too much, but it's a bank. It's, um, uh, at that point, Wells Fargo Bank. And this represents the kind of the collision of my world, and it was just a couple a couple of months before Catching Homelessness came out. So I want to read to you from the introduction from Catching Homelessness that describes this, this kind of my world's colliding, why I wrote the book. A few years ago, while working with Public Health, Seattle and King County, on a medical respite project for homeless youth, my own homeless shadow resurfaced. I was in downtown Seattle at the YWCA Women's Shelter waiting inside the front lobby for the rest of our group to arrive. We were scheduled to have a tour of the facility to see how they ran their medical respite program. I'd taken the city bus and purposefully, had purposely dressed down in jeans, a sweater, and a raincoat. It was late afternoon, raining outside, and I saw soliciting, pimping, prostituting, and drug dealing happening on the sidewalk in front of the shelter. The members of my medical respite group were buzzed in the front door. At the same time, a homeless woman resident walked up to me and asked, did you stay at a hotel last night on Aurora in, instead of here again? Aurora Avenue is one of Seattle's main prostitution areas. 
I looked up at her in alarm. I'm sorry, you must have me mixed up with someone else. I'm not staying here. I'm just visiting. The people in my group overheard this interchange. Later, they teased me about it, saying how preposterous it was. I was a university professor, for God's sake. There's no way I could be homeless, much less a homeless prostitute. But I couldn't shake the feeling that my cover had been blown, that I'd been found out, that my homeless shadow was showing. You were homeless. Why? What was wrong with you? Those are the questions people ask me or want to ask me whenever they discover I was homeless. Coming out of the closet about my own homelessness was never an option for me. It could derail my career, hurt my family, and marginalize me even more. It was largely why I'd moved across the country to Seattle to escape the memories of having been homeless in my hometown of Richmond, Virginia. But standing there in the YWCA shelter, I recognized the irony and the hypocrisy embedded in my re reaction to the woman's question. Here I was, an outspoken advocate for people who were homeless while secretly judging them, and by exten extension, judging myself. Homelessness is exhausting and soul-sucking. Homelessness has marked me. Like the star-shaped surgery scars on my belly, the body harbors secrets. Homelessness is a type of deep illness, a term coined by sociologist Arthur Frank for an illness that leaves you feeling dislocated, an illness that casts a shadow over your life. That shadow never completely goes away. At some point, it was time to acknowledge my homeless shadow, time to remember. So that describes some of my motivation for, for writing the book. Um, I also really wanted to kind of come clean with my students. I have um, continuously had students that I know about, they come um, to me to talk about it, who have experienced homelessness as an as a adolescent um, young adult. And we continue to have way too many um, of our students who are experiencing housing and food insecurity. And as a University of Washington professor, um, uh, uh, for 25 years, um, I do, I do have to say that we are not, as a, as an institution, are not doing enough to address, um, to acknowledge and address that issue. So a little bit about my story. This is me with a really bad haircut from my mother. Yeah, um, thank you, mom. And I uh, just had my first birthday and have learned to walk. And this is in the front yard of my home. Um, where I was, I was raised. And it was on the um, campgrounds, Camp Hanover, a 650-acre camp um, on the outskirts in the countryside outside of Richmond, Virginia. My father was a Presbyterian minister, and he opened the Camp Hanover and ran it for about 30 years. It was the first racially integrated children's summer camp in the South. And we um, regularly had run-ins with the KKK. Um, and I found out much later in his life from my father that our family was under surveillance by FBI because of continuous um, threats. So um, that's something I just also want to say is uh, that is not something, obviously, that's just in the South. And it wasn't just when I was growing up in the 60s. It's way too prominent in our in our country, in our world, and here in Seattle. We have to really be aware of that. So again, back to play stories. This is um, right outside my childhood um, home. And um, I, in many ways, had an idyllic childhood. It was, I had free roam of uh, beautiful, um, beautiful woods and um, and that's something that I've carried with me, that, that appreciation of nature. But at the same time, if you look at this photograph, you think, oh, it's beautiful Virginia woods. Um, the depression in the middle is not natural. It was made by the Corduroy Road, which was one of the major roads during two of the major American Civil War battles, two of the bloodiest in Cold Harbor, which is the land that I grew up on. My mother, who was a professional artist and um, 
and would take me for walks. Before I went to school, she would take me on walks pretty much every day along, along this road, and we would search, she would teach me to search for Civil War bullets, as well as quartz Indian arrowheads, because before that, um, before um, white civilization, it was the Pamunkey tribe and Pocahontas. So to recognize and kind of looking back on my own childhood, there, um, there were deeply traumatic things in the landscape as well as, it, as in um, my history and my family. So the Richmond Street Center, isn't this an ugly building? Um, the Richmond Street Center, a multi-service uh, center, we didn't have the term back then, but it basically was a navigation center um, like we have now. And it's in the heart, it was in the heart of Richmond, Virginia. It opened in the mid-1980s, and that was during the rise of what we now term uh, the new homelessness epidemic. And um, my first job out of nurse practitioner school was to, to um, open and run a nurse-run a nurse -run clinic in this building. Um, my salary was paid for by the Sisters of Bon Secours, and I worked at first um, for a very conservative Christian organization. Um, there were many things good about this building, but at the same time, I, I bring forth uh, an interview that I had with one of our public health nurses here in King County, longtime amazing woman, Heather Barr, and she was reflecting to me when she, when she talked with me about how it seems like we, we have the ugliest buildings that look like jails or one flew over the cuckoo's nest, you know, from, from mental health day, days, and that this not, it's like we punish people who are poor and homeless. Um, and that this actually recapitulates a lot of the trauma, and it also traumatizes the people who are working there. So that is something I want to, to recognize. At the same time, um, I absolutely loved my work there. Um, in this photograph, uh, I'm six months pregnant with my, with my son, and um, one of the things that I really learned out of nurse practitioner school, my first job, is um, obviously the, the nursing, the medical care, the doing, the, the bandage, the wound care, the immunizations, all of that is important, but that even more important is relationship building. And a lot of that came for me through um, doing something seemingly as simple as foot care. And foot care for people who are homeless obviously is, has an outsized importance because you know, oftentimes they're having to move around, walk on their feet, um, come up our Seattle hills in the, in the rain and in the snow, and if their feet aren't cared for, um, it can affect the rest of their health. I won't get into a lot of um, details about what happened, but two years after this photograph was taken, um, I had a collision, it has a term in, in healthcare that's called moral distress. And that is I, uh, what, I, what I knew was kind of the right thing to do for my clients, and this again was in the beginning of the HIV um, AIDS epidemic. And I began to have collisions with um, the people that I worked for, again, the, the Christian organization, over the care of HIV AIDS patients, as well as um, access to um, abortion for, for our female clients. That, as well as, as other things, and again, un unacknowledged um, childhood traumas, and I spiraled into a really severe depression and was homeless for six months, living in my car, living in an abandoned um, uh, storage shed, couch surfing, that type of thing, before I was able to extricate myself from, from homelessness, and that was with a lot of other resources. And I want to acknowledge here um, my own privileges. You know, uh, homelessness is not an equal opportunity um, affair. You know, a lot of people say homelessness can happen to anybody, at some level, yes, but the, the caveat there is not really. Um, it's m so much more likely for people who have had traumas in their lives, especially childhood traumas, as well as, um, as women and um, people of color. So the resources that I had being a white person, having, having my family that, that really valued education, I was able to have those resources um, to be able to move out of homelessness. It did, for me, um, take a Greyhound therapy um, and, and moving to Baltimore to go back to graduate school. 
So foot care is a continuing presence in my life. It's one of the things that gives me a lot of joy. I think I have some of my students in the back. Are you, are you still here? Yes. So um, some of them have probably been with me on some of these um, foot care clinics. And this is, um, and I'm going to read an excerpt about it, but we do um, with the School of Medicine, School of Dentistry, um, what we call teeth and toes clinics, where we do basic kind of dental screening, fluoride treatments, and basic foot care in area homeless shelters. So I'm going to read an excerpt that's from my Soul Stories book, and it's from a chapter called Walk in My Shoes. I'd spent the morning at a nearby women's homeless shelter as a nurse, helping a group of 10 medical and nursing students do foot care. Women soaked their feet in plastic dishpans of oatmeal-soaked water, while students sat on stools below them and washed their feet. Providing something as intimate as foot care brings out stories in people. I encourage the students to listen, to be able to hear, and perhaps to bear witness to the stories of homeless and marginalized people. It was the red sneakers Essie was wearing that drew me to her at the women's shelter earlier that day. This was the second time in the past several months I'd run into Essie at one of our foot care clinics. She wore an orange polyester shirt with a green chiffon scarf tied around her dreadlocks, a pink pleated skirt down to her ankles, and the red sneakers. She told me she only dressed in bright Caribbean colors. They keep me happy. I can't be all down in the dumps when I got these colors on. Essie had a perpetual and slightly crooked smile, the crookedness perhaps the residue of a stroke. The women's shelter is located in a church basement in downtown Seattle, near the main shopping district. It's a day shelter, a safe zone for women and children that serves homeless and marginalized near homeless women, especially those dealing with domestic violence. The shelter has multiple case managers, social workers, and volunteer nurses who try to connect women with health, housing, and social services. The shelter workers lend the women a hand, bend an ear to hear their problems, offer a leg up the socioeconomic ladder, a toehold on life. Empathy is their main tool. Empathy is what we try to cultivate in students. Empathy is feeling with as opposed to feeling for, which happens with, at arm's length, sympathy. Walking in another person's shoes is how we most, is how we most um, commonly describe empathy. But can we ever walk in another person's shoes? And is it always a good thing to try? Whenever I work with students in foot clinics, I remind them that we tend to be more empathetic towards people we know, people similar to us that climbing the socioeconomic ladder often diminishes empathy, and that experiencing our own traumas can make us more empathetic to people who have experienced similar traumas. But being a wounded healer can also cause us to have more porous boundaries, which puts us at risk of losing our sense of self, our balance. I seldom am privy to the individual traumas of my students. I don't need to know them but I do need to know that they have access to resources that help them process in positive ways, triggering events they may encounter. Participating in shelter-based foot clinics takes them out of the comforting, familiar walls of the hospital into more disturbing territory. So one of the things um, that, I, that I try to do in my, in my teaching, in my advocacy work, in my own work, is to bring in arts and humanities as a way of, of kind of deepening our understanding of ourselves and the world, and of being able to view things in a, in a different perspective, hopefully, and then individually and collectively to dream a better world. This is an example uh, weaving that I did um, of results of, uh, it's a public, public um, uh, art project that I, I have in conjunction with Soul Stories, and it's on the meaning of home. It's a values clarification activity that I, I do with people of all ages and, and, and walks of life. It's not a po um, poverty or homelessness simulation. I have ethical issues with, um, 
with simulations. This is really about just like the meaning of home for all of us. And I also get people, including adults and including the provost of our university, to use crayons to like the very last thing that you might have to um, give up if you become uh, homeless of that, that meaning of home and of illustrating it. So you can see on here, some people say safe, and also to recognize that home, and our, especially our childhood homes, have not, unfortunately, not always been safe. Um, but community, um, family, those connections. And I also um, use this to point out, and a lot of advocates I know like to kind of push back against the term homelessness and want to use houselessness instead. And what I, what I uh, say to that is that housing obviously is important. It's not the only thing. And those of us who've been homeless um, and those of us who have worked in, um, in homelessness know that just getting kind of safe supported or safe housing somewhere, if you disrupt that community building that people have already had, um, that, that that really does not, does not help them in the long term. So to some positive examples, and I, I, I apologize if I am leaving off some, I couldn't put all of them on here, but these are some evidence-based, yes, I'm a university professor, I believe in evidence, I believe in immunizations, yes. Um, and, um, and these are all evidence-based um, programs that, are, that have local uh, connections that I just want to um, kind of point out um, as, a, as a point of, of civic pride, um, as well as kind of spurring us all on to do better, to expand them. The one on the top left um, you might recognize is the 1811 Eastlake Building, partnership with um, Downtown Emergency Services Center, um, the police, the city, um, Harborview, and the health department. It's also kind of called a wet house. So um, it's housing for, ho supportive housing for 75 men and women who are considered chronic inebriates. And what we know, it opened in 2005. It was one of our, one of our nation's first housing first um, um, uh, housing units. And we do know that um, getting people housing before they have to go through all of these kind of means tests, like you have to be clean and sober, you have to be educated before you can get housing is kind of crazy. Um, but if you get them housing, a lot of times their trajectories are better, their use comes down, and also um, uh, a lot of savings to the community in terms of police, you know, revolving police as well as revolving emergency rooms. The one um, with, a, with a mom and baby, um, Nurse Family Partnership, that was not started in Seattle, it was started by David Olds um, out of Baltimore. Um, now is a national and even an international um, evidence-based project, but Seattle, our health department, was an early adopter of the Nurse Family Partnership. And this um, program pairs partners public health nurses, it has to be ESN prepared public health nurses because of the systems level knowledge, with first time parenting homeless and um, low income moms. And the nurse follows the mom and then the baby through the baby's first, uh, second birthday. And connects them not only with kind of health care issues, but also with housing, with education. And we know that, um, and again, relationship building. It's the same nurse with the same, with the same family throughout that time. And um, we know that this, especially for the baby involved, in the future, they've had this around long enough to know that um, it has a huge impact on helping that child to thrive into adulthood. A lot less juvenile justice um, system involvement, a lot less you know, perpetuation of homelessness and poverty. Um, by the way, this has one of the lowest turnover rates for jobs um, that I know of because people love it. There is an opening right now at King County, um, the health department for uh, an NFP nurse. So if you know somebody or you want the job yourself, take a look at it. And then the Mockingbird Society, um, one, of, one of the social workers who grew up in Seattle, still very active, uh, Jim Theophilus, started the Mockingbird Society. He's worked his entire adult life on trying to improve our fo foster care system as well as ending youth homelessness. And he has gone on to um, found uh, a more recent statewide project that's called Away Home. 
including a program that's called Anchor Communities um, with places like Spokane, Yakima, not Yakima, Walla Walla, I think Yakima as well, and Thurston County. And that is to try and shore up the resources in those areas so that young people, and we have upwards of 15,000 um, adolescents and young adults who become homeless every year in Washington State. And we know um, that many of them uh, end up um, on the streets um, in, in Seattle, and way too many of them have had childhood traumas, including childhood <coughs> sexual abuse, and are lured into commercial sex sexual exploitation and prostitution. So the, um, his, his project is trying to shore up resources in the local communities to have good enough homes be even better and to support young people, including LGBTQ youth who um, flee um, different situations. So that's one that I'm really um, very proud of and uh, in terms of it being in Seattle. And the, the last one on the, the bottom right, the group of individuals um, are representatives of kind of a coalition and our buyers, buyer beware um, project of really trying to turn um, the justice system and social services and everything else um, around to address our very, very severe and historically long-lasting um, uh, sexual exploitation of especially girls and women. And the young woman in the dress is Noelle Gomez, who was a prostituted teen on the streets of Seattle during Gary Ridgway, um, the Green River murder. Um, and I mean, she knew obviously some some girls who were victims of his, and she's working. She's uh, helped to co to co-found the Organization of Prostitution Survivors, which is a Seattle-based um, project. And she's working um, with families of the victims of Gary Ridgway to try and have a memorial in Seattle to remember this. Gary Ridgway is still our country's largest serial killer of children, and the vast majority of them were um, children of color, including Native American um, girls. So some different ways that all of us can, can no matter what, what our walk of life, um, no matter what our, um, our political um, affiliations are, that w what we can do in terms of homelessness, and I have these in the appendix and catching homelessness. But the first one is just to um, remember that, um, that people are people. And if somebody is asking you for a handout on the streets, that um, and you don't want to engage and you don't want to um, necessarily give them anything, to at least acknowledge them, look them in the eye if you can and say, no, I'm sorry. That one of the worst things is to be ignored when you're on the street. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And the other one is um, those of you that are in the Seattle area, if you don't already, um, but try to start purchasing real and read Real Change. It has amazing articles. And also get to know the vendors. Um, don't get in the way of them you know, doing their selling, but get to know their stories. And then the other one that I would say is get to know local organizations like Operation Nightwatch that do direct services and that also do upstream kind of prevention and policy work. I think that's really important. And the other one I just want to call out, I think it's a great resource that is just a couple of years old that Real Change has started to do every year. It's also available free online. And that's the, they update it every year and the Emerald City um, resource guide. And I think that's something that all of us could benefit from. I would love to see, I love tiny free libraries. I'm just like, yay, tiny free libraries. Um, I would love to see um, those tiny free libraries have, have one of these in each of them. So you can do that if you want to. So in the last one um, that is, that is um, I can't leave off, that is really important, I want to read to you from the epilogue um, to my Skid Road book. And this is, it's from kind of after a chapter about the state of emergency, the continued state of emergency over homelessness in King County. What I learned through the research and writing of this book helped me become more patient in some ways and less patient in others. Less patient with people who use homelessness as a political tool for their personal gain. Less patient with myself when I find my, that my, I myself fall into this category. Less patient with the seemingly never-ending and toothless versions of the 10-year plan to end homelessness, all home, one table, and whatever else comes next. 
less patient with the homelessness industrial complex that our region and our country supports in the interest of charity over justice and solidarity in any form. Less patient with myself for being part of that homelessness industrial complex and continuing to benefit from it. Less patient with our perpetuation of violence against women and children and persons of color. Less patient with our collective intolerance of opposing viewpoints and a people we see as other in all its permutations. At the same time, through this project, I became more patient with people and entire communities who struggle to survive and thrive despite seemingly insurmountable obstacles. I became more patient with myself for continuing to learn the lessons of endurance and of resistance. Although I'm not a historian, through this book project, I learned that history teaches us to take the long view. Positive change takes time. It also takes collective effort. As one of my mentors, who unfortunately I think couldn't be here today, Seattle retired social worker Nancy Amade reminded me as she reflected back on the changes that she's lived through, including the start of Medicare and Medicaid, food stamps, Head Start, the Civil Rights Act, the Americans with Disability Act, and Title IX. And I would add Roe versus Wade. She says, if you have lived through that kind of change and you've seen it happen, and most of that is stuff that helps people who are not rich and powerful, food stamp recipients are not rich and powerful, welfare moms are not rich and powerful, we can do things in this country, and you don't have to be rich and powerful to make it happen. But you do have to vote, and you do have to pay attention to who's in office. You don't have to be an expert, you just have to care. So please vote. Um, and some organizations to consider, these are uh, more national ones uh, that I, I personally like. They have great free resources. Those of you that are in healthcare, if you don't already know about it, the um, National Healthcare for the Homeless Council has a lot of uh, free trainings, on, including on trauma-informed care. They're a great resource. And um, these are the resources that I've read from tonight, including my, my Medical Margins blog. And then to uh, finish up, a resource on burnout prevention um, and uh, fatigue um, and to try to incre increase our empathy and keep us going that, again, I love social workers, um, is a local social worker, um, Laura Vandernut Lipsky, and her trauma stewardship um, book. Excellent resource. I know the library, all the libraries have it. And that includes people that are working on climate change, of how we keep going um, to do the work that needs to be done without becoming victims of whatever it is ourselves. So on that, I'll end. Thank you. So oh, um, I work in housing and in the nonprofit I work at and in the community at large, I've heard a lot of really positive responses to uh, Seattle is dying, which I see as a piece of straight up agitprop, um, which is not even remotely objective, but people have really responded to it. And even people who volunteer at organizations that mm. serve the homeless say, wasn't this a great objective look? at what's going on. How do we push back against that? What's a good way to disarm those types of really disingenuous arguments and say, you know, this does not reflect the truth? Right, thank you for that question. Um, uh, yes, yeah, Seattle is dying, and, and a brief story on that. I was um, coming back from London, UK, where I had been uh, working, uh, um, done some work with Pathways um, in, in the UK, which is, kind of their version of the National Healthcare for the Homeless um, program, and was coming back uh, right when the Seattle's Dying was breaking. And I remember like being at SeaTac and you know, being all, all whatever from, from the travel and going, what the heck is <laughs> Seattle's Dying? Um, and and I, I've watched it, I've actually watched it now um, three or four times. And what I, this is my personal opinion, um, and I do write about that um, a lot in my Skid Road book, 
is that it obviously was touching a vein. It was touching, um, it still is touching a vein, um, of, of like bathroom conversations or like um, behind closed doors conversations for a lot of people. Just like what is going on in terms of how, how visible homelessness is in, in Seattle. And I was hoping before I watched it that it would present somewhat of a balanced view. Um, and, I th and I think in that, um, by the way, uh, Seattle University's, um, uh, the, the homelessness um, program that they have and, and kind of media, media studies I think is extremely important for this, of having some media literacy of how, how our emotions um, are pulled into different things by music, by, by visuals, by stories. Um, so to be able to recognize what was going on in that. It was a powerful piece. Um, it was well done. I don't agree with it. It was well done. Um, if you notice, if you haven't, if you go back and, 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 and watch it, um, it opens with the panoramic of Harborview Medical Center and the, the, basically the jungle, um, the homeless encampment um, just south of that along I-5. And in the background, and you might have to have worked in hospitals to recognize this, it was life support um, music. It was like a heartbeat, dun, 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 like a heart, a heart monitor. And, um, and that I object to in terms of like even that use of like pulling us in and having that visual. I think especially with my lived experience, um, both having been homeless and being a homeless advocate, what I found the most offensive, morally reprehensible, was um, showing people on the streets um, who are identifiable, who are really suffering. Um, you know, the, 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 the man who was responding to you know, external stimuli, <clears throat> um, and, and then also the man with, with his pants down. And that, I think, is, uh, is, is bad journalism is just plain <laughs> bad journalism, not, not ethical. Um, and then the other thing, towards the end of, of, of providing what he considered to be evidence-based pro program, you know, from a, another part of the country, and of um, then suggesting that we just round up all people who are visibly homeless and, and lock them up in, um, in our uh, state penitentiary, which is for um, really severe um, uh, sex offenders. So that I was disappointed as an advocate that it didn't present at least some semblance of a balanced view. Um, if you haven't watched the CBS um, um, program that came out um, about homelessness in Seattle in December, kind of has a, a different view. I think that there are legitimate concerns um, that were raised um, in Seattle's dying, but again, and it has caused a lot of conversations which I think need to happen, but, um, but I again really feel that it's important for us to have that media literacy and to recognize the power of persuasion and how we're being, we're being drawn into a certain, a certain narrative that's very, very, um, uh, caustic, really, um, about what we um, can all do about Seattle. And that, I mean, we all know, I mean, I've lived, I've lived in Seattle now for 25 years and a month, um, have raised my two children here. Um, I love Seattle. It has obviously changed, and you, you hear so, so much more kind of conversations around I can't live here anymore. I'm going to move away, and that that kind of breaks my heart um, because I really do love um, Seattle. I think that we're we have a long-standing history. It's not perfect, but we have a long-standing history of being um, progressive, um, compassionate community, and also hopefully open-minded to kind of like take in opposing views, and also of being change agents, of being able to have innovative programs. And, um, and something like Seattle's dying and I'm just gonna get out and you know, move, I don't know, Idaho. Um, nothing against Idaho, by the way. Um, uh, I, I think doesn't really help um, anybody um, in our community. So that's what I would say to that.
Hi, my name's Hope. I have a question. I am interested in what we can all do, like the small actions that every single person in this room can do to help people who are struggling. My brother used to be homeless. He's not anymore, thank goodness. Um, so what I started some years ago with my kids is I always keep snacks in the glove box, and we call them the homeless snacks. And whenever we see someone who's homeless, um, we offer them a snack. And I don't know if you think it would help, but if everyone who left this room today told everyone else who had a car to just start doing that, um, I was wondering what you thought about that, because sometimes when you hear about all these problems, you go, well, what can I do to help? Uh, so I don't know, maybe not everyone can afford that, but um, I can afford to have a few small snacks, and I've actually been able to make friends with people that way. And it's not a huge thing, but to me, it's a start. So what would you think about that, and what's your advice about that? Yeah, I was trying to go back to, oh, now it's like, whee, it's all going crazy. Um, uh, kind of simple way, and yeah, obviously, simple ways to help the homeless. And that, one of the ones that I had on the screen and that, that I include is um, carrying, carrying food vouchers um, to, to grocery stores or things like that if you don't like fast food. Um, but something like that. And the other thing that I love about that story that you have um, that I think is important for all of us who have children in our lives is the modeling of compassionate um, uh, uh, responses to all of our all of our um, people in our community um, I have you know raised my children to to buy real change um, to to start to to talk to uh, Margaret who's our amazing vendor long term vendor of, of modeling that kind of compassionate behavior so you know whatever but. Um, like I'm on my, I, I ride my bike, so I wouldn't be able yeah. to take yeah. snacks uh, too easily. But whatever we do, whatever kind of walk of life that we have, um, I think of trying to figure out these ways of reaching out. And that, I mean, the other thing is, again, to kind of, I love libraries. Um, our public libraries are amazing resources in terms of, for everybody, including our um, people experiencing homelessness. And also our tiny, our little free libraries. Um, I recently, in my neighborhood, taking my granddaughter for a walk, um, came across a memoir, um, absolutely gorgeous handmade journal by an older woman who's an artist and who is, is uh, homeless. And, um, and she actually, she, she considers these being published, like passing them on to the little free library. Um, you know, so just like things like that to just have your antenna up for having, having conversations and being compassionate with, with, um, with everybody in our city. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, to piggyback off of that question, and I wanted to sort of highlight a point you made during your epilogue about the distinction between private charities and public goods, and that there are many private charities doing really good work, and services are incredibly important, but also considering the sort of macroeconomic picture of lack of publicly owned affordable housing, that that is one of the sort of central features mm -hmm. of addressing homelessness. And so um, I was curious to hear your point on you know, as we have a new city council now and as sort of the tax Amazon 2.0 campaign is starting again, there's a lot of division in the city about, you know, okay, we don't just need $530 million from the Microsoft, from Microsoft to build shelters, we need billions of dollars to build long-term affordable housing. And as voters, right, you said go out and vote, there's a lot of division about, well, we don't want to end up like Detroit, but we also have very large industries here that can provide that kind of funding. So I think that's an interesting place where voters play a really important mm -hmm. role, and I was wondering if you could comment on that. Yes, I mean, that's a complex question. Um, yes, complex question, uh, complex answer. So that, I, I would say, again, kind of going back to Nancy Amade, um, her point is to become as informed as you can. I think there was a recent study that just came out around, um, around this in terms of of the situation of homelessness in Seattle King County, looking at the um, consistent uh, loss of, of affordable, um, especially public um, uh, affordable housing, and and, and the, the massive increase in, in uh, some of our industries. Um, and that, it's extremely complex. I mean, we have, we've consistently defunded HUD um, at, the, at the national level, and a lot of people, like to blame Reagan 
um, or different different um, presidents. And you know, I'd say it it actually goes across um, uh, both parties, um, all three parties. If you're independent. Um, and the other thing that I think is extremely important that I learned from the research um, from my Skid Road book is that so much of this is actually local in terms of our, our policies and our programs, that we don't have to wait for or depend on federal programs to come in and like save the day on different things, that a lot of what we do, where we put our tax dollars, how we do our tax structure, um, uh, makes a difference in terms of Seattle. The other thing, if, if people don't know about this, um, again, kind of going back to evidence-based things, uh, um, Raj Chetty out of um, Harvard um, University, who um, has done long-term studies on, on moves to opportunity, kind of like down to the census track level, and um, at least until recently, and it might still be true, Seattle is the, is the major um, metropolitan area where a child born into poverty or homelessness has the best chance of moving out of poverty and homelessness by the time they're a young adult. And they have looked at, and they looked at this all, all sorts of different cities, of what actually helps that um, happen. And a lot of it is the social cohesion, um, access to good um, public schools, um, support for the parents, um, as 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 well as um, uh, again, just that kind of community, like parks and recreation. So those are things that we can do. We don't have to we don't have to rely on whatever the outcome is of the of the next um, presidential election. Those are things that we as citizens can actually learn about, um, you know, take a look at, and and do something to to um, make continue happen in our, in our city and region. So my question was similar. Um, I'm interested in knowing what public policy you would recommend that can build on what we have right now. I do a little bit of lobbying for the League of Women Voters on homelessness and, and affordable housing in the state legislature. And what I'm seeing is everything short of money for housing. So what other public policy suggestions do you have? So this, again, it depends on, on your, your own interest. And one of the ones that, that I showed, that again, this comes from my, my perspective in terms of, because a lot of my work has been with, um, with uh, adolescents and young adults experiencing homelessness. Um, and that is looking to, um, to Jim Theophilus' work. And he has been lobbying in the, in the, in the current legislative um, session for increasing money at the, at the state level for these local community solutions um, so that um, you know, children don't get caught up into homelessness and prostitution and, and end up on um, any streets, but including Seattle. So I think of looking, looking at that, looking at some of the organizations that I recommend, um, and finding, and like we say to our students, find what your passion is, like what you really know something about, want to know more about a certain population, and learning what some of the programs are that actually are already working that need to be scaled up more and supported. And that's and one of my pet peeves, even with the Doorway Project that I was involved with, is we do so much of having these kind of like pilot projects, these little pet projects that we fund and um, and that actually work, but then the funding goes away um, and the programs go away. And that actually recapitulates trauma for people that we're trying to serve. Um, that, you know, they start to, to, to engage with a certain program and then that funding goes away. Yes? It's one thing to put a face on homelessness. It's another thing to put your own face on homelessness. So I want to thank you for your courage in telling us about your story. Thank you. And secondly, you, you referred to media literacy in terms of that piece. Um, pardon me, I worked at Como for a while when it was a journalism venture as opposed to a propaganda venture. And accusing them of being media is insulting to real media. <laughs> so uh, I know this isn't your area and you're a professor, but I do think the foxification, uh, the Sinclarification of propaganda and then lumping it with media is troublesome. And I'm, you don't have to comment on that because you're a professor and objective, but, but it's Not frustrating really when that's 
lump together with real mm -hmm. journalism. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, thank you for that point. And from your perspective, I mean, you 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 know that, and, um, and and it's obviously a problem in our country um, on a lot of different levels, not just on homelessness that we that we need to to be aware of Who, who's behind that. I mean, that also thanks for bringing it up. Uh, stories of homelessness, of I think we need to somehow grow support where people, if they want to, if they're ready, um, to, to share their own stories of, of um, homelessness and what worked for them in terms of, uh, of surviving and getting out of homelessness or preventing homelessness to begin with, and to not have that mediated um, through anybody, no matter what uh, well-meaning journalists there are. Um, not that that isn't important, but I think of somehow having those stories and that and all of us to be able to access and listen to those stories is important. Um, this is a part research question, part uh, response to what two individuals had shared before. Um, so I guess I'll explain the context first. Uh, in terms of meaningful, tangible ways for individuals to, to help someone who's experiencing homelessness. I thought what you brought up around uh, real change, uh, like buying those papers, reading the stories, um, but also knowing the stories of the vendors is, is really important, as well as just making eye contact and, and saying hello. Those are real tangible ways to, to make someone feel human again. Um, I have been working on this project called Samaritan where we are providing smart wallets to organizations who can use them as a resource for people who are in need. They have the opportunity to, to share their goals and needs for leaving the street and they can then access the, the financial capital to meet those needs as well as the relationships. Um, and so the, the cool thing about it is uh, a lot of these individuals with the smart wallet have chosen to share those mm -hmm. Goals needs publicly. It's a pilot project with about 250 people involved. And so if you are looking for like a real tangible, immediate way to help someone experiencing homelessness, uh, you can just search Samaritan on Google Play or Apple, and you can read the goals and needs that someone has chosen to share around leaving the street and participate either financially or socially. But my question now is, um, from a research evidence-based perspective, have you seen the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of just sort of direct cash transfer hmm. type projects, basic income projects as it relates to uh, homelessness. I guess this would be like a bottom-up approach versus like a top-down policy approach. Right. Well, thank, thank you for your, for your work and for the question. And that, it also reminds me of you know, the, the work of facing homelessness. Um, they do similar um, work of getting stories out um, uh, directly from people experiencing homelessness and then having a, kind of a fun, you know, GoFundMe um, sort of fundraising thing. Um, again, personally, is my 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 reaction to that is, um, you know, again of having lots of different resources, and it probably really helps uh, many people. What what I would say with that though is in ter again in terms of relationship building and the sense of community um, that that. I react to it in terms of, of again, almost like uh, 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 commodifying, um, you know, having having homelessness. Like, here I am, a homeless person. You know, go fund me, sort of a thing, um, can be detrimental um, if the person doesn't have connections to people who they can trust and who are helping them with whatever the other things are that are non-financial in terms of, of working their way out of homelessness and staying out of homelessness. Uh, homelessness is not just a poverty issue. Um, it's not just a housing issue. Uh, there are lots of different breaks, and in, especially in terms of pre-existing trauma that, that people have not been able to have adequate access to resources to deal with in a positive way. And you all hopefully know that we live in a state that has one of the worst, uh, our country's worst um, public mental health um, uh, uh, resources. And so that, I mean, we can all, those of us with insurance, can afford some of the best mental health therapy in the country, right? Um, but uh, otherwise, you, you really can't. It's hard, hard to get that. So that's what I would just, uh, my, my own kind of caution with that um, in terms of are they um, already working with a case manager who they really like, who's on their side, that kind of thing. I think that could really help. 
Hi. Again, thank you for sharing with us. I'm a retired physician, as is my husband, and we live just up the street. So we have um, many homeless people in our neighborhood mm -hmm. on a regular basis, some of whom we recognize and um, listen to their suffering on a regular basis, often in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm interested, I'm old enough to remember when we had state institutions, this was in California, um, and for the, I'm concerned that there is a small but real subset of the homeless population who we cannot fix. No amount of mental health care is going to reach this particular, many of them inhalant users of very long standing with probably not very many brain cells left who are really incapable of taking care of themselves. And I know since the development over many years of community mental health care, less well in Washington than we should have, as you note, I'm wondering who is working on something for the poor, unfortunate souls who don't, who are not able to come in out of the rain and decline services because they are incapable of making a healthy decision for themselves. What are we doing about that population? Again, another complex question. Um, yeah, so in community mental health um, program, which uh, you mentioned, um, which you know, started back in the, the 50s and 60s at the federal level, which was actually a really good idea, trying to get rid of the very um, punitive and not well-run public mental institutions like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest uh, movie, um, and having the community support systems, in, um, and, but they were not funded. Um, so uh, I know that there are people locally as well as at the state level who are working to, um, to, to kind of see like what we could actually do, what we could build on that worked, and to have much more robust funding. Um, you know, we have more funding for uh, mental health and psychiatrists and also psychiatric um, uh, nurse practitioners at the University of Washington to have, to have um, more people that are actually working in this field. I know we have amazing uh, mental health outreach workers on the streets of Seattle. Um, and again, and some, and some kind of like pilot projects with that that I, I think that we could do better to highlight the evidence base for that and to, um, and to increase their funding as well. That is a, it is a, a complex problem. And that does wrap up our Q&A. Uh, there is a reminder from the League of Women, Women's Voters that there is a meetup on the other side of this curtain. And thank you so much for being here. And thank you. Thanks.